All right, so I think we are alive or live, <laughs> both. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome. My name is Marwa Fatafta, and I am the policy manager for the Middle East and North Africa at Access Now. I'm very excited to be moderating the press conference for today on the unfortunate events in Ethiopia and the violence that has swept the country both online <clears throat> and offline. Uh, our two speakers for today, um, my colleague Berhan Tai, she is our senior policy analyst and she leads our Africa work as well as the global work on internet shutdowns. She is based in Nairobi, Kenya. And our spec uh, second speaker is uh, Bifakado uh, Hilo, he's a writer and an advocate for liberal democracy in Ethiopia. Uh, he's the executive director for, of the Center for Advancement of Rights and Democracy. Bifakado recently received the uh, Penn International Writer of Carriage Award uh, for 2019. Congratulations. And he is the co-founder of the Zone 9 Blogger Collective. Um, before we go into the discussion, I would like to give our audience a quick uh, and brief overview of uh, the recent developments in Ethiopia. So last month uh, on June uh, 29th, um, an Oromo musician and social activist, uh, Hach Alu Hondessas was shot dead in Addis Ababa. Following his killing, some parts of Ethiopia were engulfed in protest, unrest and violence. And since then, uh, over 160 people were killed the offline troubles that rocked the country uh, were also visible in the online space. And the actors who were investigate, uh, instigating violence offline were also inciting violence and propagating hate uh, online. This is not the first time that has uh, happened in Ethiopia. And unfortunately, this won't be the last. So far, Facebook um, has failed to prevent the escalation of violence uh, or incitement to violence on its platform and services, and particularly in Ethiopia. We have half an hour to about 60 minutes to um, have this discussion, and we welcome your questions. So please drop them in the chat box on the platform. And Jumping into the conversation, in the discussion, I will start with Befakado. So could you please set the scene for us? What's happening in, in Ethiopia and what is exactly the impact of fake news and disinformation in the country? Thank you, Marwa. Uh, um, as you have already uh, mentioned, this is not the first time when uh, uh, the, the uh, impact of uh, continued disinformation uh, caused or at least triggered uh, violence on the ground because the, the people who are involved uh, in offline violence are also online, so they apparently post you know, uh, content that might lead to uh, violence or at least uh, trigger uh, uh, according to the information that we have. So this is uh, practically what what happened. So uh, especially in the past two years, Ethiopia is witnessing some sort of political uh, change or reform. Uh, at first, it was, uh, you know, mostly opening the political space and it was more of liberating, but as uh, the political uh, contestations are you know uh, becoming you know uh, wider and broader uh, the the violence on the ground has been increasing uh, we have been witnessing you know, sort of uh, violences that that were deadly and that destroyed a lot of property so uh, individuals in different parts of the the country so uh, if we take uh, the, the recent the recent phenomena it didn't exactly happen uh, because uh, there was hate speech online or false information online because uh, most of the time by, when, when the deadly violence happened, internet was shut across the, the country. But, you know, it has been building. A lot of this information was creating, you know, anger among the youngsters that are involved in the recent violence. It has been, you know, uh, building hatred 
were the community members. So just the moment Hajj Al was assassinated, even before there was little information about who might have killed uh, that artist, people were sure that some community members were the perpetrators or the, 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 the uh, killers of that artist. So they, they go out to avenge uh, he, his uh, murder and they destroyed uh, a lot of properties that killed a lot of people in, in, the, in the violence. So this is practically happening in the, the misinformation, false information in uh, hate speech online is not a separate issue to this uh, incident. It is interrelated because it has been viewed in cases to what's happening now. I think it is uh, a brief introduction to what happens, but we will come back to it all later. Indeed. Thank you very much, Bithakado. Uh, so I'll turn to Berham. I know that Access Now and a bunch of other civil society organizations from Africa, as well as from around the globe, uh, have sent a letter to Facebook. So could you please tell us about this letter uh, to Facebook and, and why now? Um, <clears throat> thanks, Mara, and, and thanks, uh, Bafik Adu. One thing that I um, also want to note on Bafik Adu's point earlier is that, you know, um, much of the violence, um, you know, there was also excessive use of uh, force by law enforcement agencies, and there was also um, a deliberate lack of, you know, presence of um, uh, law enforcement agencies. So, the, you know, the amount of people that have died is definitely attributed to those two, and, and of course, the third cause as well. Um, so, specifically addressing your question of why now, um, you know, we actually feel we were a bit late to this conversation. We've seen a spat of violence happen in October 2019. And, you know, um, uh, and, and as, as Refik Adu has mentioned earlier, um, there is, you know, the propagation of hate, hateful content online, the propagation of violence inciting content online, disinformation and misinformation on the platforms, including Facebook and YouTube and others has been, you know, left uh, as if it's, you know, the, the, the social media context in Ethiopia seem to be the wild, wild west where, uh, you know, any conversation goes, you know, you can, you, you can threaten somebody's life, you can, you know, uh, you know <laughs> try, uh, you know, put content that discriminates against 40 million people, 6 million people, it doesn't matter, you can post anything you want without any consequences from and without these platforms taking the action that they're supposed to and, you know, their corporate responsibility, their business and human rights responsibilities. Um, so they're missing all of those marks on specifically uh, th these things. So now this time around, um, you know, when the what was really quite visible, and you know, this was also visible last year when uh, generals were assassinated in the country. When when the internet went off, and a bunch of the trusted partners that are that are, that have been, you know, that have taken the burden of reporting content on on Facebook went offline because there was complete internet shutdown. Uh, again, what we saw online was this rampant content being spread online. You know, YouTube videos and and Facebook live videos calling for the assassination of communities, you know, both minority and majority, you know, ethnic groups. Um, so it was just a wild, wild west where for us, where we were like, you know, we've been late to this conversation. It's not, this is not the first time that this has happened, but, you know, we were like, it's time to, to call on these platforms. You know, we've had numerous occasions. We've talked to them off the record. We've talked to them on the record. You know, the, 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 the special rapporteur for the UN special rapporteur for freedom of expression, David Kay, um, on his last trip to Ethiopia, uh, you know, he put out a, a statement that was very clear on the implication of disinformation, misinformation on on the on the you know the the fledgling democracy in the country and its implication on uh, and potential implication on offline violence. So for us, it's you know it's, we're actually we feel we're a bit too late in this conversation. We actually feel like we're taking I, I you know when we were drafting all of this, we felt like we were being actually opportunistic using this time because we should have done this in October. We should have done this in 2019 July. We should have done this in 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 December 2018. But nothing seems to change from their end. Um, so that's you know this this is the reason we were saying you know why not now. <laughs> Um, thanks, Berhan. And so what are your demands? What Facebook needs to do? Uh, and how should they take their responsibilities towards that hate speech on its platform? Um, so the f first thing is first, right? So this, 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 this way of saying, you know, the machine learning has to learn 
the different language and you know until then uh, you know there isn't much we can do it's, it's not acceptable like how long do we have to say our lives matter how long do we have to tell facebook and other other social media platforms that people should not be put at risk because the machine learning has to learn that's you know in, in my head that's not acceptable and i'm sure and and this is not just an issue in ethiopia we've seen this in myanmar we see this in india we see this in brazil we see this in many many other countries so we are we are not an outlier in this conversation so the first one is you have to take this seriously and we can't have another myanmar happen on our hand and you doing a human rights impact assessment at the end is not something that we want in this case so this is our first demand the second one is um, so we want to like we have in, in, in the letter we have two specific you know immediate actions that need to be taken and then we have second versions. So if you look at the, the Facebook app right now um, and and in uh, the way that people can report content right now, it's only fully available in Amharic. Um, which is good that we comment that, but it also needs to be available in other language. The first one is Afan Oromo, the second one is Tigrinya. The third one is Somali, and of course, you know, other language as, as they develop, right? So this conversation of, oh, we don't have enough translators is not acceptable. You are a rich, a billion dollar worth organization. I'm sure you can hire more content moderators to, to put on board. So our first, our first demand is actually that. Content moderation, especially because majority of Ethiopians access, you know, Facebook using their mobile phones. And when you go, so on desktop, you can actually change the language. So there's a bit of an Oromo, there's a bit of an Amharic that you can use, but on mobile, um, on, on, on mobile apps, those are completely not there. So people should be able to report content in their own mother tongue. You know, even in my own mother tongue, it's so difficult to report content. Even in English, it's very difficult to report content because if you're not a lawyer, if you're not in the space, you don't understand the difference. It's very like the layman, the, the, the everyday Ethiopian does not understand the difference between hate speech and discrimination. Right, like so, there's so um, uh, the, the way that you report is, is like is so specific. So they they have to be able to provide that in, in people's mother tongue. The second one is, you know, our our second demand is pretty straightforward. Please stop, you know, the propagation of uh, violent inciting content, hateful content, on your platform. And we know, you know, we've had this conversation for how many years now we know how the algorithms work we know how you know the the automatic content suggestion systems also are used to prop to propagate prop violence so we want that to stop and we want specific actions to be taken uh, that that are visible that are that are not going to happen in closed doors we want to see this you know happening on the on, on the platforms that is visible to 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 many other ethiopians the third one and i think for us also very important in this context is that um okay, the machine learning hasn't learned my language, doesn't know how for generations, doesn't know the words that has been used to, to discriminate against me and other people for generations. Maybe let's accept that, but you have to hire content moderators. And when you hire content moderators, they have to be people that understand the social, political, economical, you know, social structures of the country. You can't just hire somebody off, off the market that that's going to be able to do this and you know and the people and, and there needs to be a very good collaboration with with not just the content moderators but you know the the human rights team within facebook the policy team has to be able to understand you can't just hire you know somebody that sits out of you know berlin or or geneva that doesn't understand the ethiopian context and needs a lot of you know time to to to, to you know to, to be able to understand these things you have to We've, you know, we've been saying this, Ethiopia is going to be the next Myanmar, especially in the, in the hateful content space, if we don't take action. So we need to see those, those, those actions being taken. The, th the third one I, and the fourth one, I think for me, what's important is that we see the cycle of violence happening over and over again. We had a similar situation in October. Now, you know, within, within eight months, we're here again, and there's nothing to guarantee that something is not going to happen, you know, in the next few months. So there needs to be an emergency escalation system for them to be able, um, you know, to adapt and to change as things happen on the ground, um, you know, so the, the context from six months ago has completely changed. So they also need to adapt. But you know, in, in, in saying this, all of these has to be in, in, in human rights and right respecting manner. We're not telling you to take down all content. We're not telling you to to you know highlight all content. That's not the case. And I think the fifth one and the most important one is they have to, like if, again, if the machine learning is not up to its task yet, you have to spend, you know money you have to invest in communities and you have to be able to teach people how to report content 
Um, so, you know, use the, the, the advertisement channels, you use TV stations to report and, and to show people on how to do this. But then you also have to do the extra work when once content is reported, it has to be taken down. What we see now is that, you know, a similar content in Amhari could be taken down. It won't be taken down in Orom, Oromifa when you report it. It will be taken down in Oromifa. It won't be taken down in Tigrinya. So all of those disparities are costing human lives. So we can't no longer negotiate with this. So these are some of the demands in, in, in the letter that we have. Thanks a lot, Berhan. I think it's a loud and clear cry uh, for Ethiopia before it turns into another Myanmar and for Facebook to take responsibility. And you rightly uh, pointed out that this is not uh, only in Ethiopia, but also includes many countries from around the world. Um, and unfortunately, it doesn't look like a problem of resources, but rather a problem of political will for them to, to take on that responsibility. I will move on to uh, back to you, uh, Bifakado. And um, I mean, you are a renowned activist and an advocate in Ethiopia, and your organization was the first to sign on that letter. Why is this? Why is this letter important to you? Um, this is important to us because you know we are uh, very much concerned about the lives that are being. Uh, lost in the properties uh, that have been lost. Uh, we have been working, you know, we have been uh, trying to monitor the social media uh, for false information and uh, hate speech. It has been there. So even though we could not find a direct re relationship between, uh, of course, there are uh, direct uh, relationships that we can cite, but, you know, uh, for example, in October, there was, uh, there was a, a, a post uh, posted by a renowned uh, activist, but we could not call it false information. Uh, we could not call it head speech, but it was complete necessity to say, uh, to, give, to give it a name. But in any case, people were angry and were uh, violent. There happened conflicts, uh, intercommunal conflicts following that post and also uh, police uh, response was brutal, but late, usually. Uh, instead of uh, preventing, it is, uh, you know, uh, using extra force once it happened in, in the side of police. So police is not doing its, um, its, its job. So at least the social media platforms must be responsible for the consequence that their uh, platform is, you know, uh, bringing as a problem so uh, they they can we also believe that they can do it because we have been reporting content that might lead to eventual violence like i was trying to uh, say earlier uh, most of the violences may not be directly related like the october one they, they may not be directly related to the violence that we witnessed, uh, witnessed uh, this month last month or uh, previously, but they build cases to address those kinds of violences. And from the past, we also expect similar incidents, uh, violent incidents might happen in the future too. We, we, we are uh, going to a much uh, uh, awaited election. It is extended due to uh, COVID pandemic, but it is going to happen anytime. Uh, in the future, in the, in, in the, in the couple of years. Uh, so the, the, there are terms that actually the machine can learn would lead to, you know, violence. So it has to uh, automatically respond to those terms and then, you know, uh, they, they can make them available if their content is not, if the contents of the posters that have those terms are not that much, they, they, dangerous, they can return them back, but they have to filter them out immediately the, the moment they are posted, because ma, most of these terms, hateful terms, would actually build cases for future violences, if not for current violence. That's what's happening. False information also play the same role. We have seen, we have seen them all. So individually, uh, let alone us, uh, who are organized enough to, to monitor and see the trends, even random individuals who are uh, using the social media in Ethiopia, who are using, frequently using Facebook in Ethiopia, know that 
some specific incidents are actually vulnerable to escalation of hateful conversations that might lead to violent uh, aggressions between people of like. So the assassination of Haj Alu actually gave that alert to almost all individuals who use social media in Ethiopia. Why uh, would the platform fail to understand these things? So similarly, uh, the, the, the political conversation has a lot of key terms that actually feed such kind of hate mongering, uh, you know, uh, conversations. And that, those are becoming also excuses for internet shutdown, uh, restriction of freedom of expression for activists, journalists, and others. We were not able to uh, access information or uh, speak what we think because internet was shut for three weeks. The government used uh, this, uh, these kinds of incidents to justify the internet shutdown, even though it's not legal or there is no um, necessary or legitimate justification for all what happened. So this is why we need the platform to be proactive instead of being reactionary after things already happened. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Bivricado and uh, Birhan. I think that brings us uh, to um, to open the floor for questions from our audience. So if you'd like to ask a question, please um, add your question to the chat box. Um, and in the meantime, I have a question for uh, the both of you. So while there is incitement to violence on the platform and when Facebook quickly or not so quickly reacts to removing these uh, documents as you uh, sorry as these this content uh, or posts as human rights organizations documenting uh, uh, human rights violations or such calls for violence and for hate do you find it um, do you like what are your demands also for the platform for Facebook to help you? your like help organizations that work on documenting human rights violations um, uh, and uh, for documentation and also to archive them for later legislate like for later litigation uh, work okay um, uh, while we are monitoring uh, the social media for, for false information and hate speech we, uh, we we find a lot of information, but we what we are at this point trying to uh, trying to do is understand the trends uh, because they make sense. The more you are monitoring the social media for this content, th they actually make sense. Uh, we know when uh, when false information escalates because it's not it's not the same trend always. When there are some incidents on the ground false information, uh, the number of false information disseminating online increases. And they aggravate the, the conflicts on the ground. Let me give you an example. For example, uh, uh, in, in October 2018, uh, the, the, some, actually in November, uh, I'm thinking in Ethiopia calendar, that's why I did. In, in November 2018, there two students were killed in, in a university in Amara, in Amara region. The, the reason was more of personal, even though it's, it's not still clear, but it, it looks personal from the information that are available. But on the social media, it was over-politicized and it has been ethnicized. So in, in a kind of domino effect, it almost reached 27 universities and it has killed about 12, it has caused the days of 12 uh, students uh, in, uh, in 2020 and 2019. So the, the social media is playing a role of escalating conflicts that happened on, on, on the ground. And there were false information that actually ethnicized those individual conflicts, the, those in deadly individual conflicts. The same thing happened in different conflicts. So uh, we, by, by, by trying to monitor, we are trying to understand some sort of relationships uh, between uh, the conflicts on ground and 
online. So if but our our resources are very limited. If many human rights organizations are involved in such activities, we would have complete image of what's happening on the social media, how we can control and prevent uh, their role as uh, aggravators of conflict on the ground. And we can maybe able to uh, prevent uh, coming conflicts or aggravations, if not, you know, at least uh, stop the previous one. Also, we can have by documenting and following the trends, we can at least uh, present information so that the, the, the victims can get justice. Uh, thank you very much. So, Berhan, would you like to comment or add something? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I think one of the things, one of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the demand that we have also on that on, in, in that letter is is to say that you know yes do take down content that is that is inciting violence that's hateful and is not within your community standards but please take take measure to 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 archive that content so that you know one day um in, in where we are now in ethiopia justice seems to be such a fluid term um you know uh, i'm not sure when we will get there but at least for victims for national jurisdiction um you know uh, mechanisms for international groups to be able to investigate um, and to understand what happened in the online space. The second one is, and I think one context that, that is important here is um, there aren't that many digital rights civil society organizations, let alone civil society organizations in Ethiopia. We've lived for the past 28 years under a dictatorship. Now that has shifted a bit. Um, there seems to be a bit more, um, you know, a, a, a freedom of expression, access to information, and many other fundamental rights. But it, we're not fully there. So, in, and Bafik Adu raises a really important point here that you know, um, one thing that we're struggling with is understanding actually what happens online. We don't have the full picture. What the you know the the few ancillary things that we mentioned to you here are things that have you know exponentially uh, you know grown online you know went viral and were able to catch the attention of many of us. There are many micro things that happen online that we're unable to you know to understand, but that have and might have you know big implications on on our fledgling democracy and and you know and and the you know a harmony and national na national cohesion of the country as well. Um, so that's one of the things that we're struggling with, but I think at least from one thing that Facebook can do right now and other platforms as well, YouTube is YouTube is going to be soon very fully implicated in this because they're also unable to take down certain content and we're definitely reach, reaching out to them soon. So I, if they're on this call, they should they should you know look look into that is um, at least archiving that content is really, really important and being able for victims and other people to have, easy ac access to that so that we can study it, we can understand it and we can learn from it. Thanks a lot, uh, Berhan. So we have a few questions from the audience and I'll start with the first. Uh, stopping disinformation was one of the justifications for the shutdown, but it actually seems to be fueled by limiting voices and online sources of information, doesn't it? So I'll pose the questions to you and whoever feels uh, wants to go first and the second can just follow uh, with the answer. Uh, I have said something about that uh, internet uh, disinformation has, uh, has been a justification for uh, internet shutdown. So uh, let me try to explain what I mean. It doesn't matter whether actually the internet shutdown uh, would uh, cause more violence on ground and suppress you know, the reporting of it or not. Uh, the, the government in any case, you know, since the platforms are not uh, are, are not responding quickly, they are using some contents online as a justification, as a, uh, as a cause that there would have been more uh, violence instigating content online if they did not shut the internet. So uh, that's why we are actually uh, asking the platforms to be, you know, proactive and to respond quickly. Otherwise, it would be used uh, as an excuse. It keeps on you know, being used as an excuse by the authoritarian government to suppress it. But uh, from what we have seen uh, now, we, we cannot even give examples because you know, it was the internet, like I said, 
it was down, uh, but in the blackout, there was violence. We heard about the violences two days later and three uh, days later. We, I, I don't believe that we have actually a clear picture of what happened. I've been visiting one of the cities, uh, the towns that actually experienced the worst violence in, in last, last, uh, last time, uh, two weeks ago, or a month ago, actually. So uh, what, I, what I understood from what I have seen yesterday is that actually the, we did not have a clear picture of what happened. The people mm, tried to explain to me uh, some of what happened and I, I tried actually uh, to, to look back into uh, what I was thinking. And there is actual gap between my understanding and uh, the reality because internet was shut. Also, we didn't learn about police restraint during that, those violences. But later they took uh, excessive force to stop the violence once it has escalated on the ground. You know, uh, if we had internet connectivity, maybe we hear about the violences early. Uh, also, there are a lot of people on, on, online, it's not only violence instigators who are online. So, you know, uh, the government will be put in pressure so that they respond quickly. Uh, in any case, the internet is down. Now it has a lot of justifications uh, because of the, the refrain from the social media uh, platforms. And now I meet every day and try to explain why internet should not be down during such violence but people usually get convinced of the government propaganda that this, this is the case. Actually, if it was uh, not down, yeah, the, the conflict would be worse. Thanks a lot. Berhan, do you want to add something? Yeah, um, I, I think what makes the internet shutdown this time around a bit different um, for us is that, you know, I personally have to have conversations with my parents where they were like, maybe this time around because it was shut down, you know, it, it was good. You can see that there's a lot of, um, and, and what that really tells me is that, you know, the government has used disinformation, misinformation, fake news and violence inciting content as a justification to shut down the internet and really at the core of it, control the narrative. So, and you know what Bifuk Adu is saying here is so important that until today, we don't know the extent of the violence in the country, not necessarily because the internet was shut down, but the, the, the fact that the internet was shut down really contributes to that. The fact that we fluctuate between saying 160 people have died to 200 to 400, there's so many you know, individuals in between that many numbers, right? Like we're talking about in actual individuals, human beings. Uh, and the fact that, you know, uh, and again, relating this back to the topic that we're talking about today, the, the lack of action from, from these platforms to take down legitimate content that's inciting violence, and there's a specific video that has been circulating around that was taken down later, was used as a justification by government officials, you know, that were either reaching out to us individually as, as people that they know, or, you know, the, as using it as a narrative in the country. So that is really dangerous and is affecting you know, human rights work is affecting freedom of expression, is affecting the press freedom and, and many other fundamental right, rights in the country. So th that's a really, you know, salient point here as well. Thanks a lot, Berham. Um, I'll move to the second question. Um, how do you feel with the concern uh, some groups have about excessive takedowns when we ask for swift action to take incitement down? Um, I, I, I can I can start with that. Our our call is not for excessive takedowns. All of these um, actions that are used to, for content moderation should be right respecting, should be within, uh, you know, within the international standards of, standards of human rights, right? Um, so uh, we've seen in many cases where, um, you know, I, and I think that Fugadu, there was at some point where your content was being either taken down or you were unable to, to post on, on, on Facebook at some point, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong about that. So that's not what we're looking for here. What we're looking for is, you know, for them to take swift action in a sense that increase the number of content moderators that you have. Um, when legitimate, what we're seeing now is not excessive takedown. And I wish the conversation was about that. 
because then that's that's again you know they shouldn't do excessive takedown but that's a very different conversation that we'll be having right now what we're seeing is you, you report the content in amharic it will be taken down it will take time but it will go down at some point you content a report in oromifa it takes a really long time before it's taken down you content a, 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 um, you report the content in tigrinya that's a whole different context so what we're seeing is not excessive takedown, rather it's the lack of takedown that we're seeing that is that might actually have an implication on, on offline uh, lives of individuals. But again, this takedown should be right respecting. There's no, you know, those two things are not the same. There's no justification for excessive takedown in this context. You know, set that set in, and what we're saying again here is that we've seen this over and over again. We should be able to learn from this. So set the right parameters, set the right emergency escalation systems. You know, you have trusted partners, you have many other folks that have been used, you know, that are in, in within this. Um, that are in engagement with, with, with Facebook. This is not the first time that is happening in Ethiopia. We've learned this from Myanmar. We've learned this from India. So please take all of that experiences and try to, to understand what is happening here. We're not asking for excessive takedowns and that should not be the case. And those two things I don't think should be synonymous. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. It's not like going from one extreme to the other. That's definitely not the solution. Um, we have another question um, and I think it's a very important one. Would you include the diaspora into this conversation? And is there a call to regulate content posted abroad that perpetuates violence in Ethiopia? Who wants uh, to start? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, well, there are a lot of content that are produced from ab abroad. Um, uh, there are political, I mean, of course, most of the, the the posters that usually uh, incite violence are politically motivated, but you know uh, they they seem it is usually ethnically targeted. But there we found pages that actually pretend to be a member of to, to pretend to be run by a member of one ethnic group, uh, and you know uh, posters hateful content against the other. But at the same time, the same page used to you know. Uh, inside violence against the same uh, ethnic group, which it pretended to be a member of previously. So, you know, uh, you somehow understand they have different political agenda or they may be from a very different ethnic um, group membership. So th there are those kinds of uh, uh, pages and when we follow the, 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 their posters, they make posters even when internet is down in Ethiopia. So we can certainly assume that they are run by a, a person uh, from the diaspora. Uh, by the way, during the past uh, days, when the internet was down, the, the, I, I found out when it is back that there is a Facebook page created to uh, report uh, hateful contents. It is. Uh, it's called Network Against State Speech Initiative, uh, also has an Amharic name member. So they reported, uh, they reported about 102 uh, contents that are violent and posted by the diaspora community uh, because it always internet was down uh, back then. And they have 72% of success uh, in, in th their reporters have been, you know, removed because they are made, they, they made the community standards of Facebook, but the remaining are still live, but we, uh, I, I have seen some of them. I still believe they should be removed because even though they don't seem uh, somehow they are violating, but you know, when you uh, understand the context on the ground, they need to be removed. So yes, there are contents and there are attempts to uh, report those as well, if I found the question well. Berhan, do you want to jump in? Um, yeah, um, so I think one thing to understand here is that, you know, the Ethiopian diaspora, um, um, because of, you know, the, 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 the 40, 50 years of injustice people have, 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 have lived through, you know, the, the diaspora in, in, in Washington, DC is a strong one, the, the diaspora in London and Stockholm, and you know, Frankfurt is you know everywhere you go. There's an Ethiopian restaurant because Ethiopians live there. 
right? Um, so that that's that's how strong the Ethiopian community is, right? Um, so that's um, and there's a reason why people are so invested in, in, in Ethiopian politics and what we've seen. And as Befik Adu has rightfully pointed out, is when the internet goes off, the hateful content doesn't stop. Um, but what what seems to happen is that you know the, the trusted partners, the people that actually for free do this work for for Facebook, not because they want to help Facebook is because they care about their country and, and, and the, the things that they're seeing online, when they go offline because they don't have access to internet, it doesn't mean that the hateful content stops. Um, so that, you know, so that, that whole Silicon Valley system of one system works for the whole rest of the world doesn't work in this context. So, and we've seen this many times, not the first time that Ethiopia has shut down the internet and the diaspora has taken over. So what adjustments have been made since the last you know, many, many, um, you know, multiple incidents of violence in, in the country. So the diaspora is really strong, has, you know, um, that, that transatlantic relationship between between those in the US, those in, in, in Europe, and those in, you know, in, in the Arab world. Um, you know, in, if you look at remit, remittance in the country, if you look at in the way that information is passed, you know, our, our struggles are not just in Ethiopia, it's it's it's, it's beyond, right? Like it's, it's, it's basically everywhere you go. So uh, again, in the way that these companies work and engage um, and with, with Ethiopian users, it's not just about the six to seven million users in Ethiopia. It's also about the folks that are in DC. It's also about the folks that are in Berlin. Um, so they have to be able to adapt and change within that. So the diaspora is, um, you know, a really significant, you know, when you talk about Ethiopia, you talk about the, the, the Ethiopians in DC. I think for me, um, that that's how strong, you know, the Ethiopian diaspora is and heavily invested in good and bad faith as well. Indeed, I actually lived in DC some time ago, and I remember how big the diaspora from Ethiopia is there. Uh, okay, so we are have. Okay, actually, we have a comment, uh, and I'll read that uh, from Dadgan Abu Bakr. He says, "Yes, lean into the into your diaspora. That's how the Sudanese uh, kept it on while the internet was shut during the revolution last year." Um, our last question uh, for today, I think, is uh, which regulatory modality, i.e. command and control, core regulation or self-regulation, do you think is the best one to achieve adequate regulation of this information on social media platforms under emer emergency situations? I see you, Burhan. Um, I don't think there's a... Um... You know, this even this idea of co-regulation, self-regulation, command and control, um, uh, like all of those things are words that don't that don't mean much to me. I think uh, at at the core of it, it has to be about what actions are going to be taken and what scenarios are we talking about. Um, so you know, if violence is happening in the Somali region in Ethiopia. That's a very different context than it, it happening in Addis. It's a very different context than it happening in, in, in Ambo, right? Um, so it has to be, so they have to think about the, the scenarios and the narratives. And I know, um, you know, for me as a social scientist, there's like, you know, I, we should sit down. They should involve anthropologists. They should involve ethnographers. They should involve psychologists. They should involve political scientists to understand what this is. If we're talking about real solutions to these problems, that is the thing that I'm seeing. But for now, I think what's really important is context context of people that understand the Ethiopian context, context of people that understand the language and the different ways that we use them. You know, and, and, our, and, and the way that Amharic is spoken, when, when you stress on certain words and when you loosen it up, it, it, it's a completely different context. So that's also what history is, right? And that's also what, what our lives are. So I think for me, it's about, you know, immediately increase your, um, it's, yes, it's about self-regulation because I don't think they can now in the state work with the government to to, to, to be co-regulated. Technically, social media is, co is under government regulation. They have to take down content that's reported to them within 24 hours. Um, technically, if they're supposed to abide by Ethiopian um, legislation right now, but that's not the case and that legislation is extremely flawed in the sense that it doesn't, it's toothless in a sense, it doesn't do anything when it comes to it doesn't do it much when it comes to you know uh, holding social media platforms accountable. You know the, the onus is on the individuals that are propagating hate, but 
that can't be the way that we're going. So it has to be about working with civil society organizations. It has to be about working with the diaspora. It has to be about working with people like Bafak Adu and others that are on the ground, that are doing this work, that are experiencing this. And you know, it's also, it has to be about human rights impact assessment, not, not one that's just gonna be shoved within, within this, this, this platforms. It has to be one that's publicly published. And we've seen some of the actions Facebook has taken after Myanmar. Um, so those, you know, that, that should be our learning, right? Like, so for me, it's not about co-regulating self-regulation. It's about taking those steps to save, you know, um, potential lives that might be lost because of the lack of action from these platforms. Uh, thanks a lot, Verhan. Yeah, it's about real action and not just policy words that are void of the local context and the real people who uh, can make an impact on the ground. Uh, Bifakadu, do you want to add something to, Ber to what Verhan said? Yeah, I, I just want yeah, to say some things. It's a lot about command and uh, control uh, when we say man, the platforms respond or uh, actually proactively, uh, you know, lead the, the uh, anti-disinformation and anti-speech campaigns. Uh, it is because their failure to actually uh, clean their platforms is, you know, uh, imposing a lot of burden on on the people uh, in authoritarian, living in authoritarian systems. You know, uh, I am a social media enthusiast myself. When it was uh, barely possible to speak to power uh, in, in Ethiopia, we used actually the social media to voice uh, ourselves, to, to, uh, to speak, you know, uh, and to be eventually heard to some extent. So. Uh, I am social media enthusiast, and uh, we, are, we, we are always concerned about, you know, uh, promoting conflict-sensitive dialogue. That can be possible when the, the platforms respond quickly and proactively. Otherwise, the governments are using it as an excuse to, to, you know, to suppress freedom of expression in the country. We have already had a law uh, that, uh, that is intended, intending to repress you know, false information disseminations. Uh, we are experiencing internet shutdowns frequently. That's why we uh, want the platforms to take over, not to, not uh, a demand to command and control. Also, uh, we know and recognize our responsibilities. We believe that we can uh, we can do something using the platform itself if uh, the platforms are cooperative enough to do you know media literacy. Uh, we also use the same platform, you know, to, do, to demand government transparency when they fail to. Uh, we also want to help them accountable when they fail in, in, in being transparent or uh, when they fail uh, to do, you know, the right governance. So uh, it should be seen as an effort to, uh, you know, to have a, an environment that we can co-regulate one another. Uh, I, I, I see it that way. Uh, thank you. So we have a comment from Myanmar, uh, from Kin. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Forgive me if I don't. Um, he says, I think, or she, uh, I think when it comes to, when it comes to respond, when it comes to responding to excessive takedowns, it shouldn't be on the civil society who are most of the time rolling the sleeves to do the stuff Facebook should be doing, given the fact that they have a lot of resources and money to do so. When the civil society asked for the consistency in, in terms of duplicate content and many more, the excessive takedown might happen. And I believe it shouldn't be circled back to the civil society's asks, but question the platform if they are doing their job right. Thanks, Burhan and all for this session. Um, we have, what I believe, last question actually, uh, from, okay. So the question reads, you have said that disinformation is spread over different platforms. Besides claiming responsibility for each of the platforms, what can civil society do to neutralize this discourse of hate online on those same platforms? If we can do. I have uh, briefly mentioned uh, what the civil society can do. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, especially it is media literacy that the civil society that uh, can, can do uh, broadly because 
you know, uh, the, the problem in our context, for example, is that people tend to believe whatever is written on the social media, what, uh, whatever the social media is, Facebook or other. Uh, so th 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 this happened because of the repressive political history we have, the mainstream media, especially the state-run media organizations that have broader reach than any other mainstream media. They have been, you know, propaganda machines for the ruling party, even they are still the same. So people tend to believe individual citizen journalists online, and when they the, 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 the people, the citizen journalists write angrily, they share some of those angers and they take, you know, uh, when they are ethnicized, uh, like they are happening most of the times, they also, you know, uh, find themselves there. They are emotionally appealing to the, to the readers. And majority of our population, if you know, are uh, the youth, like 70% of Ethiopians are below the age of 30. So, you know, they tend to believe whatever is written on the social media. So the, it needs massive campaign on media literacy. What is fake news by itself? You know, uh, how, how can it, you know, appear? Is it in a sarcastic, uh, sarcastic manner, um, in jokes, in deriving jokes, or in uh, pretending to be a fact, having figures and pictures? that are photoshopped, uh, even videos. Um, so people don't know uh, uh, much about fake, uh, fake news or false information and disinformation. They don't know the, the conceptual or the legal framework about hate, hate speech. They don't know what happens or they don't know much about the consequences of their, uh, their uh, words or wording in political conversations. So, the civil society, the role of the civil society is to educate or to use even those same platforms uh, in, in uh, teaching the, the audiences uh, about what this means to them or uh, how they should take news. But it is not an easy task. It is not, you know, to teach people, to teach social media users about fake news is not as appealing as ethnically charged, politically charged content. So it is very difficult. It takes a lot of efforts, resources, and uh, big mobilization. That's why it is difficult. But still, some organizations like ours understood the problem and our role, we believe. But like I said, it is a difficult job and it takes uh, much effort. We will try uh, as much as we can. And your efforts are indeed very crucial. So, Burhan, do you want to have the last word for the session today? Um, sure. Um, you know, so um, the reality is, you know, um, we need to do work um, on the ground. And again, um, you know, whenever I, I speak with governments, I always say nobody goes out to kill somebody because somebody on Facebook told them to go kill them. You know, in most contexts, that's not the case, right? Like, so if, if, if you're telling me to go kill somebody from a, a different ethnic group, it's, there's because there's foundational problems on the ground and, you know, generational trauma and problems that we haven't dealt with. So the honest, uh, again, you know, in this, if we're talking about violence and people being put in danger and their lives being put in danger, it's about governments taking that action. It's about conflict resolution. It's about, you know, transitional justice. It's about, you know, conflict resolution and, and reconciliation, um, right? Like, so I think civil society needs to act in that space, but then also online, um, unfortunately, again, the burden falls on on us as civil society, as activists, as 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 you know, as individuals, as researchers, um, to to carry this burden, even to have this conversation, rather than do our actual work that we're supposed to do. We're, we're you know we're busy drafting you know letters, we're busy engaging on, on in the space without without much change happening. So I and and and, and I genuinely ho hope that this is a wake up call for them and and you know so that this this cycle of violence as I, unfortunately as it continues to happen in ethiopia at least some actions should be taken in 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 the online space and in in, in platforms such as facebook uh, you know youtube twitter and and others are equally you know culpable in in in, in this so um, i'm hoping they really heed 
um, you know, we're frustrated, but you know, we're we're it's important to engage. We're we're frustrated, but you know, we're these are some of the things that we think will help this the situation. And I think, um, yeah, they should heed our, our advice. I think that's my would be my last word for this for this session. Thank you so much, Berhan and Bifakado, for the insightful conversation. Much, much appreciated. And I do hope indeed that they heed to our call. Um, I thank our audience for joining us. I hope it was also insightful for you. And um, thank you very much again. And take care, everyone. Thanks, Mara.